Juliet and Jen, it's so wonderful to meet you both. This is such an exciting show. I loved the first season of Perry Mason. I'm really enjoying season two. And a big part of that is your storyline. It really enriches the show. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think a big part of it is you guys have such a wonderful chemistry, you know, right from the bat, that first meeting that you guys have, there is, there is a, like a tension and a, a, an electricity between the two of you. Can you tell me a little bit um, how you guys, the process of how you guys build that kind of rapport and that level of comfortability with one another? We did, we, we went out for martinis. We had martinis and we, we ended up talking, I think, for maybe five hours and had so many things to talk about. I think we developed a rapport really quickly with each other and I adore Jen. And um, so it was actually very, very natural. It was very easy into talking about quite big subjects, which I think is very Della and Anita. They're sort mm -hmm. of straight in. There's no kind of... Um, there's no small talk. And um, so it actually felt really easy to start beginning a, a, a friendship and also a dialogue about like, what do we want this relationship to be? And I think we both really wanted it to be authentically Della and Anita, whatever that means, just mm -hmm. who, what would this be between them? And I, I just love the fact that Jen's Anita is just, she breaks so many molds she's so um original and exciting and mm -hmm. um so it's it's a wonderful new element that comes into the show and and definitely into Della's life in a big way yeah. I think we also found humor together both in our friendship and it was inevitable that that bled into the characters which I think because we've seen Della be so measured because she has to be in her career and in these relationships with her colleagues I think like we just made each other laugh a lot. And I think like finding the joy, because I think sometimes stories about falling in love, especially in a situation where it is forbidden in some way, mm -hmm. tilt towards being uh, heavy and, and sort of bogged down. And so it was just really fun to like find the levity between these two people who were just like, let's fall in love and say yes to it. And so it did, it did in that way. It felt easy. It felt like we were teammates. Oh, I love that. I mean, that's interesting you bring up the forbidden love because I was, as I was watching it, I was thinking, wow, this is so aesthetically accurate to the period. Um, there's a lot of like gender politics that are accurate to the period, but there's almost around your story, like almost like a retro futurism and this beautiful what if, because at least within sort of your inner circles, the romance feels very normalized. It doesn't feel like it's something that you have to hide. Um, can you talk a little bit about that aspect? That's interesting. I th I think, uh, yeah, we've talked about, we talked about this a lot, actually, when we were working, which was like, what's the line between aspirational storytelling, especially when it comes to queer stories and historical representation because you I, I feel like we you can't tip too far one way otherwise it disrespects the story itself and so i think the fact that we as the audience are getting to watch them fall in love and feel confidence in that love was important but i do think especially as we move further through the season it was also important and juliet you can speak more to this but that we there was a, a, a low lying anxiety or at least um, having your head on a swivel around mm -hmm. who was, who was around. And, and, you know, in episode three, we really only see them, seen them in private spaces other than the boxing match, which of course they yeah. were not touching each other. Uh -huh. So I think as we move through the season and may or may not get to see them in situations where there is no one else around, um, or where there is rather, where they're in public, I think that type of code switching, we b both worked really hard. And Juliet did a beautiful job, both like ushering me into the show, but she had lived with this character for a year. So I think that part was so uh, well uh, researched and well loved on her mm. part that I sort of had to like make sure I kept up. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that was so lovely about season one was that very subtly it was set up that Berger, Hamilton Berger and Della have this 
relationship of, you know, every Thursday night, we sort of made up this backstory that every Thursday night they go out together, you know, as a couple. And, yeah. and it means that they can go out and have a great time and, and they're both gay and they're both um, sort of have a small amount of access to a world where that's kind of safe in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Because we researched that about the period that there were a lot of sort of hidden places, like famous mm -hmm. clubs that you could go and meet with people. Um, I think sort of that was sort of already there. And I think the, the the next layer with that Jen and I really worked on was, you know, what is the bit that, how much of Della and Anita, are they aware of the fact that, well, we can do this much in public because it looks like we're just friends? Or mm. but if we, you know, if we get too close or can we whisper in each other's ear? How close can our lips get? Can we hold hands? Can we not hold hands? Like all those questions we kind of mapped out the entire journey together very specifically because I think they would have been really, really aware of the fact that one false move really ends career, ends a lot mm. of things very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really interesting thing to explore together. Yeah, because it also informs the physicality between them in such a more nuanced way because I'm um, certainly not to eroticize the trauma of our, our queer foremothers, but when they are in situations, Del and Anita, where they know they cannot touch, every yeah. glance and like graze of the elbow has more meaning. And I mean, their entire meeting, in fact, is brokered on a glance. It's brokered on a look across a restaurant, which mm -hmm. is the kind of queer coding that I know we we really wanted to honor. Um, and I, I'm I'm really proud of the way that we did that. And that required a lot of communication, but it also I think ended up just coming naturally to us because once you have those costumes on, yeah. <laughs> it, it's hard. It is hard, I think, to to reference your a, a contemporary experience. And so um I yeah, I I got a, emotional a couple of times thinking about it. Like I'm looking at her in that outfit and feeling myself and mine and thinking like. This would have just been so different. So, yeah. And there's yeah. also the wonderful thing of like, you know, there's so many etiquette rules that, that we learn. And Jen and I have both done quite a lot of period work and, and love that period. So I feel like we both were quite aware of the fact of when you would wear gloves, when you wear your hat, when you take your hat off, all those little etiquette um, details. But then to add in this other layer of sort of hidden coding and detailing of of touching and where can you touch and where not were, were really exciting They're really well, it's exciting. just hot also i mean let's be serious <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. yeah the hand the hand, hand grazing is hot let's bring back hand grazing hand grazing. <laughs> normalize yeah. hand grazing 2023 yeah. i love it <laughs> jen's, jen's famous I, whisper in the ear sort of great <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that I was I have been kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop as I watched the the relationship develop, and I was like, is this just me being paranoid? So it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Um, which you know, that is period accurate, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little. I mean, you you touched a little bit on sort of like um, queer foremothers, like, and there is. You know, we do get hints of, as the season progresses, sort of this underground, sort of like sapphic glitterati is what I'm calling them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and, God, that's what I call my quilting club. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I think, unfortunately, like so much of our queer history has been lost. And the golden age of Hollywood, I mean, was so queer it's the arts of course it was um can you talk a little bit about maybe if you had any sort of historical figures that you really um that inspired aspects of your role or that you look to um when you were crafting these roles did you Jules I mean a, a couple of different people for different reasons I mean Kate Hepburn is one, is someone that obviously I think everybody references again and again, but kind of interesting for our storyline too. Um, and so I, I look, I sort of, I looked at her quite a lot for that, for sort of the element of um, being a sort of career driven woman in, in a situation where you're having to sort of play the game a certain way. Um, 
I think she also informed quite a lot of our relationship in different ways too, for both of us. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, I think it's impossible. We're, we're both like old school, yeah. you know, classic Hollywood film nerd. And so it was like, you don't have to ask us twice, like hold my earrings. Like we will step into that in a heartbeat. And so all of those women, I know we had both grown up watching and um, wanting so desperately to emulate I, I, Anita. This Anita was actually loosely inspired pun intended by a real person called Anita Luce, who was a screenwriter one of the only females were successful female screenwriters in the studio system. And she wrote uh, gentlemen prefer blondes was her, her, I think uh, best known work, but she had been working in the studio system since she was like 16 and was a total badass. And she wrote um, an autobiography called the girl like I, which I'm so pissed that title is already taken um, for mine, but uh, <laughs> she, she, to our knowledge was not queer. Um, though I kind of feel like, you know, she was, she was around town in whatever way she felt, but, um, <laughs> she was married like 19 times, but I, that was very helpful just to, um, I think acquaint myself with her, the book is written in her voice and it is, it's probably one tick to Mae West. Then we wanted to go for this show. Cause that was another thing we talked a lot about was like how we wanted to be period accurate with the language and with the sound of the language, but also I think as one of our um, lovely producers said to me and rightly so one day, um, it's getting a little too gramophony. And I was like, <laughs> copy you, copy you. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, I have to stop watching uh, my girl Friday. I, yeah. So uh, <laughs> that was an interesting thing to navigate. Um, but sorry, I've, I've gone a bit tangential to your question about uh, queer foremothers. We actually, Juliet and I both read the same book whose name we can now remember. Today. I remember the book. <laughs> There's a book that is about specifically queer women in the 1930s in Los Angeles. Um, I'm pretty sure my therapist gave to me and I, I read it before. And we, when we met, I was like, you have to read this. And then Juliet dove into it. And we had so many great late night discussions about things neither of us knew. So yeah. that was helpful. There was also this wonderful um, uh, chapter in the book all about romantic love between women and and that sort of thing of, you know, how how so often it's displayed as like women just get into bed fully clothed, have a little kiss and fall asleep, you know, and that kind of whole idea of like, that's as far as it goes. And and obviously that, that not being the case. <laughs> it was really exciting to actually figure out like what that would look like with us. And there was also, I mean, without telling you where this goes but it there's a I, I really love the fact that at the beginning we start in that powder room and we're separate yeah. all the mirrors and yeah. then you know you we we have the boxing um and suddenly we're in public but it's all really a, a very male um uh experience sort of surrounded by a lot of testosterone and, it, and it's a totally different environment and as we move forward there's this wonderful moment where we're away from LA and, and, and able to be sort of outside and without saying what happens, but it's, it's a really, I loved that aspect of their journey that even every single location and place and how they in, interact with each other and with the world um, in terms of their relationship was also, I felt very much been really thought through in terms of what, what our, um, um, generations of women before us would have dealt mm. with of how mm -hmm. to navigate the world like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know we can't spoil things entirely, but I think that Perry Mason, the show, has taught us about happy endings, that they tend to be more bittersweet, a little bit more complicated. But is there any reason to have hope for Della? <laughs> <Yeah>. There's <laughs> a reason to have hope. Yeah, okay. there's always a reason to have hope. There's a reason to have hope. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good. good, good. Yes. So I have a sort of a frivolous, I want to close on a little bit of a frivolous question, but it's, I selfishly just want to ask about it. And that is the costuming. Like you said, it really informed the character. It really helped you root yourself in the time period. But it's also just really, really beautiful. And I want to put it all on my body. So I would love to know <laughs> what the experience was for each of you to get to wear the costuming, how much you got to inform the, mm. the costuming, if you had input. And if like Anita, 
anything came home from you from set. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know where that came from. Um, our brilliant costume designer, Catherine Adair. Am I pronouncing her last name right, Julia? I yeah. it occurred to me recently that I had never said her surname aloud, which is ridiculous. Name, because, yeah. Anyway, she was just she was just Mother Catherine to me, but um, she. Oh my God, her and her entire team did such an incredible job of not only being period accurate, but I think just like quietly stitching in, pun intended, um, the emotional arc of all of these characters, which is tough to do against a landscape that's meant to be in muted browns, which was the period. And it was collaborative. And I, one of the fun things with specifically with regards to the queer element was that Juliet and I both got to be like, when do we get to wear pants? Yeah. Like when, <laughs> when do we get to wear trousers and what, and, but jokes aside, like actually when, like, when would it be appropriate without tipping our hand, like showing yeah. our hand? Um, and so I think the like one time I got to wear pants, it was a very big day for me. I was like, I have been trousers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to wear pants the whole way through. <laughs> Della had worn pants last season, but with Perry outside at a bonfire. And it was really interesting because we kept having this plan. And then, but with the storyline with Anita, every time we'd, you know, we'd turn up to wear pants, um, we'd go, oh, no, it, it might give it away here, or this might be too obvious here because of the fact that Della is really falling in love and is much more vulnerable and much more exposed. Mm. So even just that detail, the pants detail, yeah. was a big talking yeah. point. And the um, color, right? Because I think we we kind of, uh, Catherine did this brilliant thing, um, Kate, where the color, the trajectory of the colors sort of went in opposite directions. And it was wild to to watch them work that in and so helpful and meaningful and um there you know the shape where i will say i don't miss but um that's that's the only thing <laughs> i say this to someone who's like never shot something that takes place in the 18th century so literally every actress who has is like please shut up <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. i mean Anita, there are times where she looks like she had stepped out of a painting. Like I found myself thinking a lot about Gustav Klimt, um, mm -hmm. as well as Tamara de Lampica. Like there, when yeah. you're in that car, you are the you are that painting. It's it's this the show is just so 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 beautiful. Um, the story is incredible, but you could just like look at it. It's so it's so fantastic. Well, and Kate was incredible because she also built us she built us wardrobes of clothes. So we had this many blouses and this many dresses and this many and and they were so specific to the fact that particularly for Anita, she was able because Anita's a screenwriter in Hollywood, you can bring so much more of that into her character just through that clothing. Um, but that was also wonderful of the days that we would come in and go, OK, let's build this look today. That actually it was incredibly helpful. It's, it makes you feel so much more Della, so much more Anita when you come in and you're able to sort of choose your wardrobe for the day. Yeah. Right. And another thing Kate did, which I so appreciated and I feel like is so rarely done, is she let us repeat pieces because she was like, these are not millionaires. And even if they were, that's not how people work. Like you're going to wear the same blouse twice in a, in a three month period. And so there were times where she would say, okay, well maybe this skirt, but, but let's do your favorite blouse. And so having that was so special because it wasn't just like you come in and wear something totally new every day. So in that way they did feel, I mean, literally lived in. Oh, I love it. I love it. See, it's these little subtle touches that ha happen behind the scenes that I think you pick up subconsciously that just make the characters feel real lived in. And I think, that's a big part of why, you know, this works so well. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. This has been so much fun. I cannot wait to see what happens next. And I'm filled with uh, anxiety and anticipation Honestly. about it. <laughs> but a little bit of hope. A little, a little bit, bit of hope. hope. <laughs> it was great to talk to you. Thank you.